I want to welcome everybody. My name is Larry Levin. I'm part of the Market and Shopper Intelligence and the Thought Leadership team here at IRI. And it is a pleasure to welcome everybody to our discussion about cannabis and uh, the opportunities that are ripe and resident in this important burgeoning category. Just some parameters for everybody to understand. We are recording today's session so that uh, everybody will have an opportunity to listen to this and see it again. The deck and a, um, uh, a PDF recording, a PDF of the deck and a recording will be sent out to participants later today. Uh, also, you may notice at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A area. That is where we would ask you to submit any questions for Jessica and I to talk as we go through the uh, presentation. Um, also, should know that if you haven't heard a podcast that uh, Jessica and I did with Aaron Morris from Wild, I invite you to download that too. And later on, when we send the link to this pod, to this webinar and the deck, we will have a link to the podcast that we did as well. So there's some interesting information in that. Um, I'm real excited to spend some time talking today because as we all know, 2020 was really the year of the asterisk. We saw sales in the CPG industry in general top grow by 11%. You're going to see as Jessica tells the story today about the importance of the cannabis market that while CPG in general grew at 11%, the cannabis industry grew four times faster. And granted, you know, the bases are, are small, but the bases are opportunistic. And there are so many opportunities for this business, both from a dispensary point of view, where I know a lot of you currently market your products, but also mainstream retail. And you'll see as the story unfolds that there is a 15 time growth opportunity that BDSA and IRI are forecasting for uh, mainstream retail and the, and the cannabis market. The other thing that I think you'll be very intrigued by as Jessica tells her story today is the significant growth, not just in people who are using cannabis, but also who are open to using cannabis. When Jessica and I started working together a few years ago, I'd say about two thirds of the US population was either using or interested in using cannabis. And today that's nearly three out of four consumers. So the momentum is there behind the product category. And I think as we're coming out of COVID and we're looking for ways to inspire growth for our companies, nothing fits better than an opportunity within cannabis. And to that point, I'd love for uh, my partner, uh, Megan, to throw up a question because we'd love to get some idea from the audience about how involved you are in cannabis. So. Just curious of whether your company's exploring the possibility of incorporating cannabis in any of your new product uh, development efforts. Uh, answers are simple. Yes, we're already incorporating cannabis. Yes, we're currently exploring as a possibility. No, we have explored um, and decided against it. No, we've not explored and wouldn't consider. I don't know and not applicable. And by the way, for my IRI partners, if you could answer not applicable, not that I want to bias you how to answer, but really looking for the manufacturer and the retailer perspective on this. So. We'll give it a few seconds and everybody will get to see the results as they pop up. I feel like we're on Jeopardy right now. Like we should be, I mean, that's a do, 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 do. Whoever wanted me to sing, hopefully you didn't hang up on the webinar. All right, Megan, do we have a good sample of responses? Do. We have about 64%. So let me go ahead and share those results. Okay. Beautiful. So about half of the audience is either very much involved or, or looking at getting involved. And when I fa factor out 36% that are not applicable, that's actually a very significant amount, amount of our participants today are very involved in the cannabis industry. And I think that really sets the importance of this as a category. And it's my pleasure to welcome a friend and a, uh, a partner, Jessica Lucas. Jessica, for those of you who don't know, has been serving as one of the lead analysts for BDSA for about five years now. She's a an Indiana Hoosier by, uh, by college, but she is a Denver mom. And a, uh, I, I don't wanna to steal too much of her thunder, but, uh, she is uh, an acknowledged user in the, in the category and uh, probably we'll talk about the wine mom versus the cannabis mom as she tells her story today. But BDSA is a very important partner to IRI. It is our strategic partner for all things around 
the cannabis industry. And as the story unfolds today, the assets of BDSA are brought into this, as well as some of the market tracking that IRI is doing from a CBD and hemp perspective. But we're going to talk a lot about the retail sales tracking that BDSA is doing, the market forecast, the expectations, not just in the US, but globally. And then it's also beautifully tailored with consumer insights, because it's important to understand not just the whys, but who are the people that are actioning in this category. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome Jessica to the stage. Jess, over to you. Thanks, Larry. Um, just a quick ad for everyone, whether you're a cannabis participant from the BDSA side of things or an IRI client, um, really important to call out here. Um, the retail sales tracking, think about that as your scan data. Um, so what is selling where, when, at what price point in the dispensary channel? Um, really important to call out for the IRI clients. Uh, that data as a channel, dispensary channel, is available um, through IRI's platform. So it doesn't have to be a separate access point. Um, market forecast, this is looking at the future. So what's the total addressable market by state, by province, and in 38 countries globally? Um, within hemp-derived CBD, as well as all things marijuana um, over the next five years. What's really critical there is, again, our partnership with IRI allows us access to everything that's going on in mainstream retail channels as it pertains to hemp-derived CBD. So again, another integration point between our two companies in this holistic view. Um, and then the last piece, as Larry mentioned, is BDSA does conduct our own consumer tracking research across the total US as well as Canada. Um, we've also taken that kind of proprietary methodology and overlaid that on top of IRI's panel. So we can identify cannabis consumers as well as non-consumers and CBD consumers and non-consumers and their behavior across other industries. Um, so a lot that we do separate as two different companies and a lot that BDSA and IRI have integrated together over the last few years. So for those of you who have seen us present before, some of this is a, a recap, but it's important to call out that it's never a recap because everything in cannabis is constantly evolving. Um, and all of those participants on this call or this webinar who comes from cannabis could tell you that what reality was a month ago in this industry, state by state or country by country, um, is likely different than it is today. That's how quickly things are changing. So a couple of things worth calling out before we really jump in. Um, as Larry mentioned, you will see in this presentation the adoption and the acceptance of cannabis. When I say cannabis, I am specifically referring to marijuana. We are now at about 75% of adults in fully legal states open to or already consuming cannabis. And the interesting thing is that doesn't look that different from the rest of the U.S., regardless of regulatory systems or whether or not it's legal. Um, also calling out innovation. There are so many product formats, and that is something that you need to take away from this conversation, is as you think about cannabinoids, cannabinoids being THC, CBD, CBN, CBG, THCA, THCV, you name Delta-8, Delta-9, you name it. Um, those are cannabinoids, and the cannabinoids are now available across product formats. So from flour to pre-rolled joints to vapes to what we call dabbable concentrates, um, ingestible products, which include candy and chocolate and taffies and beverages um, to tinctures to topical applications. Um, there's not any other real industry you can consider being available in so many different product formats. And we'll touch on what cross-consumption looks like. Um, but just like most of you um, in the CPG industry, think about consumer targets and segments or shopper segments and need states and occasions. Um, it gets really fun, but also very complex when you're thinking about use cases and need states um, that span 100% medical to more health and wellness to 100% social recreational. And then you also layer in you know, the hundreds of different categories that are available for consumers to ingest or utilize cannabinoids. Um, so definitely a lot of innovations happening. Um, and Larry and I will get to this towards the end, but as we think about what those innovations mean, both for the cannabis industry, but also the impact it will have on other industries as the cannabis experience becomes more um, specific in terms of onset and offset as we think about ingestible products. There's a lot that's going to factor in here as the technology and the product formats continue to change. Um, I will call out, we won't get into this too much, but as Larry mentioned, definitely listen to the podcast because it's great to hear Aaron from Wild specifically speak to a CPG audience about the challenges that you're facing if you're in this industry. 
every country or sorry, every state is essentially its own country. Um, you cannot move product across states, even if two states are both legal and they border one another. Um, so essentially, if you are a business in the space, scaling is challenging and expensive. There's a lot of different routes to market that we see regulation state by state in terms of product format, labeling, um, what's available, what's not, what's medical, what's not, um, very different. So again, there are a lot of challenges that the operators in this industry face in terms of um, launching a product and generating awareness. Um, I'll also speak to some challenges and struggles. Um, they can't just spend a lot of money and do mass marketing. Um, there are a lot of restrictions on where you can and cannot market um, cannabinoid infused products. So with that, um, just a quick look at, um, I'm not going to speak to this in detail, but wanted to put this in here as a reference point for those who are not in this industry or are not familiar, um, but a quick visualization of thinking about cannabis sativa and hemp versus marijuana or hemp versus cannabis. And specifically, as we think about that designation of CBD and CBD being a cannabinoid that can be pulled from both hemp and marijuana. So just wanted to remind everyone of kind of what is this space? What, is, what does this look like as we start breaking it down? So I'm gonna kick off with a market outlook. Um, where have we been? Where are we today? And where does BDSA anticipate this global market to be over the next five years? Um, the timing, Larry, of this webinar is good and bad. <laughs> Good because it's a really critical time period. Bad because actually BDSA is releasing our updated market forecast on September 15th. So everything I show you today is getting updated in two weeks. Um, just like other uh, growing industries, uh, the market size, the market dynamics, the regulatory framework, the number of licenses, consumer adoption is constantly evolving. So we update our market forecasts Again, think about that as total addressable market by state. So thinking about Illinois versus California versus Missouri versus Florida, down by category, category or form factors being flower, pre-rolls, vape, dabbable concentrates, edibles, sublinguals, and so on. Um, and we're looking out five years. A lot of factors come in play there. Obviously regulations, form factor availability, um, number of licenses, meaning how many licenses has the state released for operating retail, timeline for retail opening, just because a market is kind of passed by law as adult use legal doesn't mean it's enacted immediately. Um, there's always a kind of a bit of a delay in terms of regulatory frameworks. Um, then we have to assess consumer adoption, consumer penetration, as well as consumption dynamics. Um, because we are constantly looking into a crystal ball, predicting what we think will happen um, in terms of regulations. Um, sometimes we are right, oftentimes we are right, sometimes we are wrong, um, which is why we have to update these market forecasts every six months to take into account anything that has changed that we did not predict to happen. So with that stated, just a quick map of the US. As I mentioned, we do do market forecasts globally in 40 countries. In the US, we break it by state and category. Um, in Canada, we break it by province and by category as well. But you can see this evolution of the regulations loosening across the US. Um, it's really, really fun for us to see this dark blue. Um, this is our, actually some of the states look blue, some look black, so I'm not sure. Um, but this is what we're looking at in, in terms of thinking about fully adult use legal markets. It is worth calling out Many of these markets are also medically legal markets, so they have dual channels. Um, then you kind of see the turquoise color. Those are your medically legal markets only um, with different regulations, again, state by state of what ailments um, are considered part of the medical program. So the fun thing about thinking about the fully adult use legal markets is it's not just the Wild West anymore. You have two major players in Illinois and Michigan, very large markets, very successful markets, very different regulatory frameworks and number of licenses. Um, Illinois is often one we talk a lot about because it is a bit of a hub as you think about the large multi-state operators, many of them being headquartered in Chicago. Um, not surprisingly, very similar to a lot of consumer packaged goods companies being headquartered in Chicago. Um, and then now you look on the East Coast as well, and we have Massachusetts and Maine. Obviously, um, we are also closely tracking New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut as those three markets come online. 
And as we think about regulations as well as consumer adoption or population kind of belief around cannabis, it's kind of a chicken or the egg conversation. Um, regulations opening, does that drive more people to believe that cannabis should be legal and therefore open to consumption? Or are regulations opening because consumers are becoming uh, more open to this as well? So it can go both ways. But generally, and we've seen this for some time, the majority of the population agrees there should be some form of legalization across the US. And as Larry mentioned early on, he kind of spoiled this slide a little bit. Um, when we look at 2019 versus 2020, looking at total global markets um, within regulated legal cannabis up 45%, narrow down to the US specifically, and you see the markets are up 48%. Um, spoiler on this, um, the US drives the global market right now for cannabis and adult use markets, specifically California adult use, the largest global legal cannabis market drives a lot of what's happening in the US. Um, medical market still very critical and important. Um, adult use market is where the volume comes from. Um, and to Larry's point earlier on, you know, comparing this level of growth rate versus what was seen in IRI's tracking for CPG of plus 11%. And if we break down 2020, I don't want to spend too much time on 2020 because it's crazy. We're almost at the end of 2021. But just looking at general trends, the one thing I want to call out here is consistency. So despite what I said earlier of every U.S. state is essentially its own country, generally purchase behaviors, trends look largely similar. Um, this is 2020, so we can all call out the March, April, May weirdness. Um, that is our COVID impact. Um, really important to call out here, Nevada and Massachusetts markets essentially shut down as a COVID response. Um, it was not deemed essential businesses from the beginning, um, some of which was shut down in terms of in store, some shut down completely and then opened up pretty quickly. Um, but there was a little bit of a hiccup there, which is why you see some general downward trends. Um, also important to call out Illinois. Um, Illinois became adult use legal in January of 2020. So it was medically legal in 2019, turned on fully adult use legal January 2020 with a retail framework set up. So in a fully adult use market um, within two and a half months, three months, obviously we hit March. So Illinois is a great example of uh, cannabis going from illicit to deemed essential in a four month time period from the end of 2019 to the kind of beginning of the COVID impact in March. Um, really fun to call that out specifically, again, as an industry that was illicit and illegal in December of 2019 and deemed essential in March of 2020. Um, I think that's a good example of like, what does it mean to be in this industry? Um, and it is obviously a legitimate industry that everyone is focused on. Now let's look at 2021 year to date. Um, so great, huge growth rates we saw 2020 versus 2019, but you might be asking now, what does the market look like in 2021? We've seen substantial growth, uh, growth across markets that we track. Um, really important to call out, and I know I'm a broken record here, again, every state is essentially, it's, it's a different country. So as we think about BDSA tracking, we have to set up a representative sample or panel of retailers in every single state because the product catalog, the brand availability, and the SKUs available are very different, as well as the retail landscape and the regulations. So we will chip away and we continue to chip away to have national representation, um, but we have to enter markets for BDSA very differently than let's say IRI would enter a national marketplace. Um, so again, thinking about those trackings, you can see really large growth numbers, not surprising in Illinois, because again, uh, 2020 was the first year of legalization that market has expanded in terms of products in the retail footprint. But even in our most mature markets, think about Oregon, California, Nevada, Colorado, you still see significant year over year growth rates. We'll speak to it in a little bit. Um, again, this is expansion of the retail footprint. Just because a state is legal doesn't mean every county allows for uh, legal cannabis sales. So that is one thing that I don't think a lot of people know if they're not in the industry. Just because Colorado is legal doesn't mean every county allows the sale. Um, so as we think about retail footprint expanding, as well as consumers, more consumers consuming and consumers consuming more frequently, that is driving a lot of the growth here. So let's look forward. So we've looked at 2019, 2020, and now 2021. What are we expecting to happen over the next five years? 
right now, and spoiler, this is going to change in the next two weeks, and this number will be even larger. We are anticipating a $40 billion market for legal cannabis sales in the U.S. by 2026. The two colors are the two different channels, um, one channel being the medical channel and the other adult use, as I mentioned earlier. Adult use drives the growth in the U.S. and the U.S. drives global growth as of today. Um, a really good comparison as you think about other countries, Canada, obviously very important as we think about the global cannabis market, but the size of the market in Canada is about equivalent to the size of the California cannabis market. So really important to kind of bring ourselves back to that. The last thing I'll call out, and none of you really have to experience this in your industries if you are on the CPG side of it, but that turquoise box is important to note. Um, 41 billion is the legal prediction from BDSA. BDSA still expects a $40 billion illicit market in the U.S. in 2026. So important to call out there, um, the total addressable market is different than the total addressable market for the legal market specifically. Again, always important to come back to that. Last thing I'll call out, top five markets we anticipate in 2026, California, Colorado, already adult use legal, Florida, New York, New Jersey, all medically legal. None of those are yet adult use legal. So those markets will emerge, become adult use, and we anticipate being top drivers of sales as we look out to 2026. All right, so now thinking about what does that mean? So we're talking total sales in the US. How does that break down by different categories? Um, and you can see here concentrates, that's going to be your dabbable concentrates and vapes, um, flour um, purchased by weight, oftentimes now branded and prepackaged. Um, these are truly branded products, still king. So as we think about dollar share, um, edibles gets a lot of play, edibles gets a lot of press, beverages we'll talk about get a lot of press, but flour and concentrates, which are inhalables, are still king as we think about marijuana sales purchasing and consumption. Um, and then breaking down those categories specific, first half of 2021 versus the first half of 2020 on the right-hand side, you can see those large growth rates year over year across categories. Um, so as we compare this to the performance year to date within um, IRIs tracked channels and categories, um, you know, 30 to 60% growth rate in, in cannabis across categories versus an average of four to 5% in IRI tracked uh, categories. So again, thinking about the formats, thinking about continual growth across all of the different form factors. As we break this down further, um, just want to spend a little bit of time focused specifically on edibles, as that's probably relevant to a lot of the IRI clients, the CPG side of this. Um, not surprising, edibles dominated by candy, candy dominated by gummies. Um, gummies has emerged and has been the powerhouse product format as we think about ingestible products within the dispensary channel. Um, you can see just the sheer size of that. As you saw in the previous slide, don't forget, edibles are only representing about 14% of dollar sales going through the dispensary channel. So again, edibles really important, growing, driving growth with a lot of interesting categories. However, inhalables are still king. I will call out here for those of you who haven't paid attention, um, BDSA does have a blog and we highlight brands. Um, we like to highlight top brands, but we also like to call out brands that might be falling a little bit under the radar. The gummy companies get a lot of play. As Larry and I were on the podcast with Wild, you probably all have heard of Kiva and Wana and Sunderstorm. There's some top players in gummies that are fairly well known within cannabis and even outside of cannabis. Um, we did do a blog post touting um, five non-gummy edible brands to watch. So if you want to look at some other form factors, whether that be taffy or beverages or hard candies, um, caramels, there's a lot of interesting things happening beyond gummies in the marketplace. And we can't do any presentation without talking about cannabinoid beverages. Um, beverages are the hot topic all the time. So again, as we think about breaking this down, Edibles are about 14% of dollar sales in the dispensary channel. Beverages represent about 5% of edibles. So now we're down to a very small percent, state by state, around 1% of sales um, coming from the cannabinoid beverage market. So I want to call out beverages are small, but they are growing. 
Um, and it, again, I just want to ground everyone in this is a small percent of edibles and edibles is a fairly small percent of total sales. Um, really important category. We're watching it closely. Obviously, 60% year over year growth is huge, um, but it is off of a small base. But there are really interesting things happening with beverages um, to be lower dose, to be more sessionable, to specifically compete with other functional beverages, um, whether those are cannabinoid infused to help with sleep or energy um, or concentration, or if those are cannabinoid beverages targeted at replacing beverage alcohol. It's really important um, for you all, if you are in the beverage industry, to keep up to date on what's happening within both dispensary channel beverages as well as the hemp-derived CBD beverages emerging across the U.S. So we talked about legal regulated cannabis market forecast, what you're looking at right now. So that 41.3 billion in 2026 in purple should look familiar because I already showed you that number as we think about the regulated marijuana market in the US. What I'm showing you right now is that cannabinoid market sales sold through dispensary. Layered on top of that is BDSA's prediction of the market opportunity. Um, we anticipate to come from hemp CBD products sold through general market retail. Um, this is IRI track channels, e-commerce, and so on. And then the last piece is true pharmaceutical application, um, like the FDA-approved Epidiolex. So again, um, we go from a $41 billion legal regulated cannabis market in 2026. Reminder, another $40 billion in the illicit market. And we layer on top of that our anticipation for hemp-derived CBD and prescription applications, again, talking about a legal cannabinoid-infused product market of $61 billion by 2026. And this is one of the key slides that I see that really shows the general opportunity available in our industry when you think about that $17 billion opportunity that uh, BDSA and IRI can be tracking through general retail. All right, and quickly, I'm going to touch on this very quickly, but edibles anticipated, and we anticipate edibles assuming, which is a very big assumption, that the FDA um, determines how we're going to regulate um, CBD as a, a food additive or in an, an adjustable product. Um, but we are anticipating a lot of the growth in that mainstream channel, as Larry mentioned, kind of the IRI track channels to come from ingestible product formats. And the last thing, because we can't not talk about beverages, as I mentioned, break down cannabinoid beverages as well. Um, and we do anticipate a big play here in mainstream retail beverages being your hemp-derived CBD beverages, actually being a much larger segment of the market than the THC beverages available in the dispensary channel. Um, so again, predicting about a $2.5 billion cannabinoid beverage market by 2026. All right, so let's jump into a little bit more on consumer. Um, as we mentioned early on, about 75% of adults in fully legal states are either currently consuming or open to consuming. Um, so again, 73% breaks down into almost 45% um, being consumers and another 30% being um, acceptors, meaning they don't currently consume, but they are open to it a lot of those people most open to a topical or an ingestible or edible format as that point of entry. Many of them also interested in the benefits of CBD. Again, more of that health wellness focus. Um, but really important to call out in fully legal states, almost 75% of adults are now kind of bought in to consuming. This is up, as you can see below, from about 63% at the beginning of 2018. So again, we continue to see this grow with a very large growth in that percent of the population who are actually cannabis consumers. So from 32% in the beginning of 2018 to now 43%. Um, rejectors, um, those are the people who don't currently consume nor are they open to it, does not mean they oppose it. It's just not right for them. Um, some people do oppose it, but not all of them. And we break this down even for, further and just looking year over year, so the first half of 2020 versus the first half of 2021, across some interesting market breaks, what percent of adults did we find are consuming cannabis? Level one is our designation for fully adult use legal states in aggregate and weighted based on population. Um, so obviously California would have a greater impact on this percent just given the sheer size of the market. Um, but even in those fully legal states, we saw the percent of the population consuming cannabis go from around 35% to now almost 45%. Level two, those are medically only legal markets. 
um, huge jump in the percent consuming. Massachusetts, year over year, um, 2020 to 2021 was an adult use market the entire time, big growth. Florida, medical only market, still big growth. And then I threw in two examples of more mature markets and you still see the percent of the population consuming growing. So the point here is this isn't driven by one single market. This is across the US, regardless of the stage of legalization. And really there is no single cannabis consumer. If you've heard me talk before, we've broken down the stereotypes. <laughs> However, we're currently working on a bit of a blog post. that's like, don't forget about your heavy consumers who are driving so much sales. So yes, low dose, micro dosing, infrequent consumers, that base is growing, but so is heavy daily consumers um, consuming for multi-purpose and multi-faceted reasons. Um, we'll get into that for, further, but really important to call out. We're talking about everyone at this point. This is mainstream. Um, the, the group, and I'll show it to you in a quick demographic profile, but the cannabis consumer doesn't look any different than kind of your average consumer. Further, and not to get into too much detail, but uh, we have taken all of this consumer research and um, conducted true segmentation. So allowing our clients to think about their product portfolio, um, their innovation opportunities, um, assortment within stores very similar to what a lot of CPG companies do in terms of breaking down the size of different consumer segments, the need states, the occasions, what form factors fit and how might you message. Um, interestingly in cannabis, we do look at this amongst the cannabis consumer population as well as non-consumers because there's a big opportunity to overcome some of those hurdles to get non-consumers to be consumers in this space. Quick demographic look, I just pulled out the average California cannabis consumer. Um, the numbers in purple are from the first half of this year and then you see a comparison from the last year. Um, we're seeing a 50-50 male-female split in California. A large majority of these people are actually parents. Um, Larry alluded to this, but I am a cannabis consumer. Um, I actually tried out a new product, Larry, uh, last night. I don't know if I should admit that while I was reviewing this deck. Um, and it's actually a, 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 almost like a pixie stick style format. So it's a powder um, that is flavored, that is a sublingual. Um, so you kind of like dump it in your mouth. Um, really interesting new form factor um, and a, a relatively new product innovation in Colorado. So um, I will not, uh, it, it is not something that we shy away from, from talking about our actual personal consumption. Um, they are younger. So you can see a, a large percent of cannabis consumers also skewing below 35. Um, and a lot of city suburb dwellers, not surprising, um, a couple of factors here tend to be younger in general and more accepting of cannabis, but also um, this is where the products are most available. Um, so as I mentioned before, just because a state is legal doesn't mean every city and every county allows for it. Um, and then I wanted to show a quick view of the average CBD consumer. It doesn't look that different either. So anyone out there thinking hemp derived CBD is so different from marijuana, it's not. There's a lot of consistencies in terms of who these people are and the functional benefits they are seeking regardless of whether or not that's coming from a THC CBD ratio product or a hemp CBD exclusive product. As we think about consumption dynamics, again, talking about edibles specifically, about 70% of cannabis consumers consume edibles in fully legal states and 34% of cannabis consumers actually prefer an edible format. Um, this is percent of people, as I mentioned before, percent of dollars still heavily skewed about 80% into inhalables. And if we break this down, I mentioned this earlier, but there's a lot of cross consumption. So it's not that people are an exclusive um, single format consumer within cannabis. Um, just breaking down some numbers here, 72% of cannabis consumers consume via inhalable formats in fully legal states. Of inhalable consumers, almost 70% of them also consume edibles. So again, a lot of cross consumption across inhalables, inhalables including flour and pre-roll, um, vape and dabbable concentrates, and those people choosing across those form factors, but also incorporating gummies and chocolate and infused baked goods and tinctures and sublinguals and pills and capsules and tablets into their consumption habits and behaviors as well. In addition to that, you also have topicals. So um, creams, balms, salves, lotions, predominantly used for pain management. 
um, break this down. The reason you see that is because different product formats, people identify with different use cases. So there's cross consumption because different form factors are either more convenient or discreet. Um, smoking obviously very different than consuming an adjustable format, um, but different form factors depending on different use cases or functional benefits people are seeking. Um, calling out specifically um, the number one reasons people consume inhalables, topicals, and edibles, you can see here. I also called out the top reasons for consuming CBD specific products. Again, not that different as we think about marijuana versus those functional benefits people are seeking from specifically CBD. Well, Jessica, this has been a great story. And I think what's really important now is trying to relate this into the CPG industry, uh, because that's what the vast majority of the audience right now plays in the, in, in the traditional CPG space. And, you know, I hope so far everybody's sort of seen these opportunities that are resident it's not too often that you see a, a consumer group go from 35% to 45%. Um, you know, there's just so many metrics here that show the upward potential for this. So you talked earlier about multi-state operators and um, talk a little bit about, you know, who they are and what they're doing to really kind of change the, the landscape because, um, you know, I, I like your analogy that every state is its own country. And so how do these companies over, overcome different barriers? Yeah, so um, we refer to these as MSOs, so multi-state operators. In most cases, when that term is used, it's oftentimes used incorrectly um, because we jump to MSOs being vertically integrated operators across different states. Um, and a lot of these, and you can see the logos here, if you keep up on any news, specifically financial news, you would have heard these names. These are the largest, in most cases, publicly traded multi-state operators in the U.S. Um, I didn't tout them here, but you also have to kind of consider Canadian licensed producers or Canadian LPs as part of this space as well. Um, so really, these MSOs, um, many of them starting in um, limited license vertical medical markets. So owning the supply chain from cultivation to manufacturing, to brands, to retail, having that end to end. Um, most of these operate in that manner, both in markets in which it is still first forced vertical integration like Florida, um, but also many of them working in markets like Illinois and California and Arizona and Colorado now. Um, so important to call out these groups because these are the parent companies. Um, these are the large players who operate um, many of the largest retailers across markets, as well as many of the top brands. Um, again, if you're watching the news, acquisitions, mergers are happening constantly. Um, I'm sure many of you, if you, again, you pay attention to this, the one this week was a Terrasend um, press release that they are acquiring Gage, Gage being a top um, retailer and um, player in the Michigan market. Um, Terrison being um, a multi-state operator with a lot of dominance in a handful of uh, states as well. So again, always new news here and really important to keep in mind um, these big players exist and the big continue to get bigger. Um, that doesn't mean independent brands and players aren't mainstays as well. Yeah, so just to that oh, point, go ahead. And just to that point, as you transition to uh, manufacturers, one of the things that my uh, dear friend and partner, Joan Driggs and I, um, are constantly looking at new product innovation from a new product pace setter perspective. And this year, for the first time in pace setters, we had hemp vana, a hemp derived product, make pace setters. And certainly the brands that you see here, while they may not be pace setters the next year or two, I have a feeling that as products like Wild and Wana and Rhythm become more mainstream, we will see them become new product pace setters. And I think that this is just the you know, again, the tip of the iceberg of opportunities. So talk a little bit about these companies that are kind of making headway in both inhalables and edibles. Yeah, and what's nice about looking at these top brands on this page versus, you know, these, these parent companies or this MSOs on the prior page um, is if I go through these, um, Rhythm is an inhalable brand owned by Green Thumb, Green Thumb being an MSO headquartered in Chicago. Cresco Cannabis being an inhalable brand owned by Cresco Labs, again, headquartered in Chicago. You have Steezy, a dominant inhalable brand, specifically vapes um, in California and expanding across markets. They are part of an MSO called Shrine Group. Um, Raw Garden, an independent 
vape player who is dominating and has dominated the vape market in California. Um, and then we talk about edibles. We have Juana um, that really grew out of Colorado and has since um, moved and expanded into most of the major medical and adult use legal states. Um, Wild, obviously listen to the podcast, hear their story of their expansion and how they go about this, state by state dominance. Um, Kiva, again, coming from California and expanding across markets. And Incredibles being a Colorado edible brand that was actually purchased by Green Thumb. So again, thinking about the MSOs and the acquisition and the mergers, Green Thumb acquired Incredibles and has since brought it into all of the markets they participate, driving um, distribution-based brand growth. So again, a lot of different strategies as these brands emerge, typically in a single market, and then expand across markets. Um, there's not a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, some brands set up operations in every single state. Some brands license their brand to an operator who owns licenses in those states. Some get, obviously, part of a multi-state operator or a bigger entity. Um, and then others obviously partnering or licensing their brand. Again, a lot of different ways that they are expanding across uh, either dominating a single market, but also expanding across states. Just as you think about retailers and their challenge of having the right amount of assortment, how have you seen changes in the marketplace from the number of SKUs or the number of manufacturers on shelf a couple of years ago versus today, or what do you expect the future to look like? Yeah, it really depends on the state. Um, it's kind of interesting to look market by market where, you know, in 2021 in California, um, I think we're probably tracking 2,500 different brands in California alone. Compare that to Illinois. Um, Illinois, a really strong legal market, um, but very consolidated in terms of licenses and the number of players in that market. So again, 2,500 brands operating and selling products this year in California versus I believe the numbers around 75 or 80 brands total in Illinois. So those numbers look really different. Um, it's not necessarily that we would expect uh, Illinois to look like California, um, but we definitely have seen some shifts in some markets where the number of brands increases drastically, and in other states we're seeing kind of uh, the long tail die off a little bit as the markets get more and more mature. Um, yeah, I yeah. will, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, when you think about the 2,500 brands out here in California versus 75 and my, uh, my hometown state of Illinois, it's kind of interesting because it brings me to think about what my friend Sam Gallardi talks about with e-commerce a lot with the long tail of products available online. Transitioning to that, how did you see this industry do with e-commerce in particular during COVID? Yeah, so there's a lot of really interesting things happening. So with COVID, um, in states where online pre-order and pickup where that previously was not legal, that opened up in most markets. So in a lot of states, delivery and online pre-order was not available. Um, and now uh, at least online pre-order is pretty much a mainstay in most markets. Um, so a little different than mail order, but still online e-commerce. Um, we have definitely seen uh, delivery has been a huge driver of sales and volume in California for some time. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard of the company Ease. There's a lot of players doing interesting things as it pertains to direct delivery to consumers. Um, and we're seeing that expand across states. So I think there's a lot of things that, um, I'll just go to the next slide. As we think about, you know, do the rules of CPG apply to cannabis? There's a lot of areas where I would say, generally, yes. You know, we are all, um, whether we were before or just now after COVID or during COVID, um, reliant on pre-order, DoorDash, Grubhub, delivery, grocery delivery, you name it. Um, we're definitely seeing that same thing happen within cannabis with a lot of um, even direct to consumer plays we're starting to see emerge. Um, however, again, worth calling out, you still cannot mail order um, your cannabis products. And, and do you think that the routes to market are similar or different than traditional CPG? And you know, from what you've talked to clients about, do they typically go through stage getting process of concept development and forecasting and trying to be first to market or is the strategy better to take a wait and see attitude? Yeah, I think it's it, it kind of 
it depends on the company and what works for them, but I, I think it spans um, fairly sophisticated in thinking about consumers and needs and product assortment and product portfolio um, management. However, and I would even stand behind this, um, it's really important not to over-engineer um, and to overthink this. The cannabis companies don't, they can't have a two-year innovation process to get things right. Two years, the market's completely different and they've lost the opportunity. So they have to move really fast. Um, that is in terms of moving fast within a single market and potentially for some of them moving fast as they think about um, market expansion and entering new states. Um, and we've seen some brands and I mentioned a few of them like Raw Garden, who has just dominated a single market like California. Um, and then you see other brands that are really strong in one state and then they push across states as well. So there's a lot of different strategies as we think about this. Um, I will tell you, yes, there is ideation. Yes, there is concept testing. Um, there is a lot of thought that goes into what's happening in this space, um, but still they have to move fast. As I mentioned earlier on, like what the market looked like a month ago doesn't necessarily mean it looks like that this month. Um, you know, and don't forget, this is a, a cultivated plant. Um, and so that does drive kind of what's on the marketplace in terms of wholesale flour available, um, which is a really interesting dynamic to think about when you consider building a business within cannabis. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Uh, you know, the whole mantra of getting a market fast is not just a phenomena that we see within the cannabis industry, but even one that Joan and I uncovered um, in our paysetter exploration because our number one coffee creamer came to life from Starbucks creamers in nine months. So everybody's getting the message they've got to innovate quickly. And, uh, you know, maybe the cannabis folks are a little ahead of the game, but it's a, it's a mantra that we're all seeing. Um, when you talk a little bit about this huge base of acceptors that we're seeing up to 73%, and I think about 40% of the acceptors are users, what percent of people who try don't want to come back? And, and how do they overcome the rejector? You know, it's funny. You asked me a question and you stumped me because I don't know that number off the top of my head. Um, <laughs> I, no, it's completely fine. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know the number of people who try and don't come back. I will say, though, there, there has historically been a pretty large number of people who fall in the either acceptor or rejector bucket and the reason they say they are either open to consuming but don't consume or they're not open to consuming um, is because they had a bad past experience. And so that's really important to consider um, as you think about this space. In general, even your most, your heaviest consumer, your, your most dedicated consumer who um, Coincidentally, 70% of inhalable consumers consume at least daily. So for anyone out there who saw my number saying, you know, 45% of consumers, sorry, 45% of adults are consumers. Of that, 70% consume inhalables. And of that, 70% of those people are consuming at least daily. Um, regardless of your kind of where you fall in frequency of consumption, um, we continue to find that consumers want to have a good experience. And so as we think about what that means for brands, um, consumers are also telling us that eh, brands don't yet really matter. But then they also on the flip tell us, um, I buy products that are familiar to me, that somebody has recommended to me, or one that I've used before and had a good experience. So um, I know I didn't directly answer your question, but you know there are a lot of people who don't currently consume because they had a bad past experience, whether that was an uneducated, I don't know if I should say uneducated, it's probably not the right word, um, but an uh, uh, unthoughtful consumption of an ingestible or edible product. Um, which is less of the norm now, but when the markets first opened, everybody had like what they call the bad edible story. Um, they consumed too much. They didn't wait the 45 minutes to see if they were going to get an impact and they ate another one. And then all of a sudden they had a bad experience. So that definitely exists. Um, also, you know, we can't disregard the fact that people have had bad experiences with illicit products. And that's going to be a challenge for this marketplace um, to educate and overcome some of those hurdles. Yeah. You know, the other thing I, I was thinking about is um, this whole idea that we have this big base of acceptors, largely consumers, but there's a group of people who say they'll try it, but they haven't yet. 
when I think about the funnel and I think about all the CPG people that we have on the call, what do we need to do to help induce these people that are on the cusp of making that decision to come to the category, but haven't yet? What are the key things? Is it, and is the point of entry typically a gummy because it's easiest, uh, uh, easiest yeah. to answer? I, I, a lot of the people who say they're open to it, but they don't currently consume, let's be very clear. Some of those, it's just not available to them. Um, they might live in a state or a county where it's not legally sold. Um, so that's one factor. Um, another, which, you know, we're all seeing companies change their policies, but some people are open to consuming and would like to consume, but they can't because of the professions they're in. So that plays a factor here. Um, and then a big piece of this is really about education and experience. A lot of these people saying, I don't know the right dosage. I don't know how to consume. I don't know what to consume. I don't know how frequently I should consume. Um, and so a lot of kind of obviously brands and retailers in the space have done a lot to drive education, um, to have a good experience as you walk into a retail location. Um, you know, what anybody out there on um, this call who lives in an illicit state, um, I'm not sure what's in your mind when you think about walking into a dispensary, but you should probably forget everything you assume. Um, some of you might have the right mind. There are still, you know, strip mall dispensaries with bars on the windows. Yes, those exist, but there are very upscale catered experiences as well and everything in between, just like you would experience in any other retail channel. I think a good comparison, and Larry, tell me if you think I'm wrong here, to think about the varying degrees of dispensaries in the products um, Probably a good surrogate would be like thinking about C stores, right? Convenience stores. You can have a really like kind of like down and dirty, get to the point, just trying to get gas and grab a soda all the way up to like a more uh, catered experience. And I think in some cases, convenience chains could be a good surrogate as, as you think about the different options available as you think about retail um, within the dispensary channel as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how many of folks in the audience have been to a MedMen but to me, that's like going to an Apple store. You've got great products. You've got great people there to consult with you. At the same time, you can buy apparel. I mean, it's just uh, you know, sort of a full service. I, I, you know, I, well, I've been asking a lot of questions. The audience actually has a few questions too. And one of them is, uh, do we have any ins insights into the Latino community and how they are uh, consuming relative to the general pop? Yeah, we definitely do. So all of the consumer research that we do, just like um, what IRI is able to do with their panel, um, can be broken down in any way, shape, or form, whether that is need state, use cases, product formats, um, as well as demographics. So I can't speak directly by state what that looks like, but it's definitely something that um, our analytics and insights team and our clients explore quite frequently. Um, unfortunately, Larry, I just don't have anything to say off the top of my head of like what we've generally seen, but it's a great question and one that we could definitely come back to. Yeah, and, and we can also certainly delve deeply into that through our own data sets of CBD and hemp data and compare it through some of our loyalty programs that we've got to understand demos. Um, another question that we're getting is, uh, what's your expectation of average selling prices the market matures? Yeah, it's a great question. And I wish I had a slide in here because I definitely have a chart that compares pricing by state over time. Um, it, it really is, and I, and I hate to say this for the 50th time, I feel like in the last hour, it really is state by state. Um, the pricing dynamics are different by state and within a state, they're different by category. So looking at Oregon flower market over the last five years is gonna be really different than looking at the Illinois market over the last two years. So again, considering pricing dynamics, we have generally, this is generally, and I hate saying this, but I'm gonna say it. We've generally seen over time, the price per gram of flour decline. Um, but that's not fair to say, because that doesn't mean that super premium or differentiated brands and products haven't done really well and actually seen significant growth. Um, one thing I'll call out is pre-roll joints. Um, we have seen significant growth and you saw it on the side. I think we had 60% year of year growth for pre-rolls, largely driven by infused pre-rolls. So being infused with something else um, that is more of a concentrate product. Um, those are priced at a significant premium and those have grown significantly. So it's just hard to pinpoint exactly what we anticipate happening for pricing, but generally the price per gram of flour, or the price per pound of flour has declined over time in more mature markets. 
And, and just because we're a CPG audience, when you talk about flower, you're talking about F L O W E R. Yes, not, you're not, correct. Sorry. Not, not baking flour. So just to uh, throw that out there. Yeah, um, flour is, uh, you know, obviously a, a good term to describe, I don't know, weed, bud, whatever you want to call it. But flour is like the, the plant. It's like saying cannabis instead of marijuana, you know? Yeah. You know, one, another interesting question is um, what is the market doing to uh, target the parental audience? And, uh, um, you know, how do you go after targets uh, in a less traditional media type of an opportunity? Yeah, a lot of social play. Um, not surprising to probably any of you out there in the CPG world, um, but, you know, loyalty, loyalty programs, mobile tracking, mobile offers, texts, you know, all of the sophisticated things you guys do to drive either um consumers to go into a specific retailer, whether that's 7-Eleven or Kroger or Safeway or Target to buy a specific brand, the brands within cannabis are doing that same thing. And retailers are doing the same thing too, keeping their shoppers loyal, keeping their shoppers and catering off offers, whether that's by product format or deal type or promotion calendars, getting people to come back to their store and convincing those who maybe have only gone to their store one or two times and maybe shop at other dispensaries to come back. Um, so it is very sophisticated in terms of thinking about behavior and targeting. Um, but don't forget, there's a lot of restrictions around marketing and I wish we could open the floor for any cannabis brands that are on here and have them raise their hand, but many of them would tell you, um, you know, their, their social media uh, pages get kicked off. Um, there's a lot of restrictions put into place. Um, and so mass marketing is very difficult, if not illegal or highly regulated across markets. So Jess, we have one minute to go. And I think it'd be nice to close on that one slide that you had, because we're getting some questions from the audience about legislative challenges uh, at a federal level. So uh, with a minute to go, maybe we want to just do our little wrap up slide. Sure. Um, let me just jump here. Um, just so you guys all know, obviously, if you're keeping an eye on what's going on with bills and federal legalization, um, BDSA is still um, planning or assuming federal legalization in 2022, but that will be state by state. Um, we don't anticipate uh, the proposed bill to pass. Obviously it's got a lot of work to do, but again, we're anticipating 2022 federal legalization, but that's not a light switch. It will still be state by state and we don't anticipate that shaking up um, kind of immediately. Hemp CBD, obviously, as all of you continuing to track what the FDA is or is not saying about how that's going to be regulated in mainstream retail. Um, you guys probably all know, I'm sure there's some retailers on here. Um, there are retailers taking ingestible CBD products in the mainstream, correction, hemp derived uh, CBD products in mainstream retail. Um, but the big players still aren't touching that, waiting for that kind of regulation coming from the FDA. Um, Again, everything we mentioned today, and if you've heard me talk in prior years, you know, continuing to just see um, this industry elevate, become sophisticated, move really, really fast. Um, the evolution of brands and products and innovation and technology is unheard of. Um, there's a lot of capital being invested in this space. Um, you know, we could list off the CPG beverage alcohol tobacco companies who have put billions of dollars into cannabis, as well as pharmaceuticals. Um, so again, we, we anticipate this to continue to drive, to continue to grow, obviously legalization to continue to spread. And honestly, the big companies are just going to get bigger. Um, so I will leave it at that, Larry, unless there's anything else that I missed. No, I think, I think it's great, Jess. Thank you for a very insightful hour. I hope our audience really enjoyed it. We do have a survey for folks to uh, complete as you exit, but we really want to thank Jessica and the audience for participating. And uh, on behalf of uh, IRI and BDSA, I'm Larry Levin, and thank you, and have a great afternoon.